Well, I, for I, one, am ready. Are you? You unprofessional group of podcasters. <laughs> My next podcast will be with professionals. <laughs> hey, who you call on a podcaster? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You guys ready? I miss that show just because of that song. That's a great song. Uh, okay. Is that the drinking show? Uh, that's insane. Oh, that's insane. <laughs> I know that. I'm on that. I don't think the drinking show had a song. Oh, no, we did. I, we did. Think of what it was. I, I just talked to John Larson Roll on the Skype the other day. Um, Whoa. I had a mic fall on me. Uh oh, I was gonna say someone fell down. <laughs> Danny's fallen and he can't get up. You had a mic fall on you? Was he cute? <laughs> I like the spawn remix for Who the Bell Tolls. You know, Patrick just keeps displaying more and more depth. Spawn okay. remix. So okay, I guess we're ready, huh? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, let's, let's do, do it. Her. Right, everybody, here we go. Um, As they say here in the South, let's get her done. <laughs> get her done. You had to say that, didn't you? <laughs> get her done. Okay, here we go. Hi, Nina. She's particularly loud tonight. Everybody, welcome to What Drives Us, episode 58, recorded March 30th, 2011. I am Russell Frost, and I am but one of your co-hosts this week. And I'm Dana Cooper, your other co-host on this ride through magical, magical hybrid and EV and, and the most magical of all, hydrogen <laughs> driving <laughs> technologies. Free for everyone this week. And uh, this week, Danny and I are very happy to be joined by Prius Chat moderator, founding member of the Chicago Hybrid Group, Mr. Tony Schaefer. You lie. You're not happy. Uh, someone's saying hi to me in the chat room? No. Odd. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm not. Actually, it's been a really bad day, but this is going to be a great show. So I'm, I'm All right. turn it around right here. We'll keep up the optimism. Absolutely. And the moderator of the Yahoo Prius group, one of the geniuses behind Green Drive Expo, her name is Linda Weideman. Hello, everybody from Wisconsin, where spring has sprung. You know, they're talking about snow here tonight. I kind of resent that. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, you're not, but that's okay. No, not really. No. You deserve it. I, I do. We've had it. You deserve it. I do. And finally, our resident hypermiler and Honda expert, it is Mr. Jason Holder. Hello from southern Indiana, where spring is trying to spring, and hasn't quite yet, but uh, I'm looking forward to it when it does happen. There we go. Well, uh, we have a panel. We have a couple of co-hosts. Uh, should we do a show, Danny? Let's try. Right. <laughs> Again with the optimism. <laughs> what, the, what the heck, eh? Um, yeah, the hey. What? You betcha. Oh, you betcha. Oh, geez. Let's what? not go there, please. <laughs> Flip the pale and picture. Oh, no. And, uh, scare uh, oh, I'll pull it up. Don't make me. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to run everybody out of the chat room immediately. <laughs> it's a weapon. You know, it's a weapon. Ay, ay, ay. Um, Autoblog Green reported this week uh, is something that I haven't seen since uh, the 70s. And for those of you that weren't born yet, they were a long time ago. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, apparently, fuel prices are such uh, are so high. Uh, this article quotes eight dollars and three cents per U.S. gallon at the current exchange rate. That uh, gas siphoning is back in vogue. Uh, something that again happened in the uh, '70s in the United States, which is odd when you think about the gas price then. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, and and I just kind of wanted to put this up there to go. Uh, hey, folks here in America, here's your future. Enjoy it. Yep. 
I remember when this was happening during the uh, shortages after Katrina here in the southeast. Really? People really? Siphoning. Yeah, there was siphoning going on. Oh, wow. Now, it took me a while in, in reading this. I mean, you know, to be honest, it, it it took me a while to realize they were talking about siphoning the gasoline out of large trucks, like semi-tractor trailers. And the the part that really threw me off here was they said, these days, with a vehicle with 1,000 liters or 264.2 gallons of fuel, you're talking about a pump value of 2,171 U.S. dollars. And I'm thinking, what kind of car is carrying around 264 gallons? <laughs> uh, that, I think that's the this year's Escalade, isn't it? I can't even get 11 in my Prius. I mean, how how hot does it have to be for the bladder in my Prius to stretch it that much? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty hot. Let's just say you don't want to be there when it happens. However, I must say that siphoning technology has certainly increased since the 1970s because they're talking about battery-powered siphons. Yeah. Wow, these guys, are they're doing good. They're uptown, man. I've That's only it. seen the human-powered siphons. Yeah. yeah. Human plus rubber hose. <laughs> and I only saw that in college. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> else, Tony. TMI, Tony. <laughs> mm-hmm. We don't want to talk about that on the show. but uh, And sort of going along with uh, that article was an article in the Detroit Free Press uh, today or yesterday um, that just fueled my exceptional amount of cynicism. Uh, and and the, the headline says it all. Sales of fuel-efficient autos stall despite guy, uh, high gas prices. Um, and, of course, that's sort of slanted a little bit because sales of some fuel efficient vehicles have installed at all in fact they've kicked into high gear uh but in general the, it appears that americans are still very much enamored with their very large and very in fuel inefficient vehicles and I, I don't know this is just like a, a face palm for me i don't get it i i honestly don't like what what is it that has what has to happen well, I lost all respect for the, I shouldn't say all respect, I lost a lot of respect for the author when he got to my favorite um, misconstruction down here about halfway through the article, talking about in the first two months of the year when Chevy sold 602 volts, Nissan sold 154 Leafs in the same period, Cadillac sold 2,793 Escalades, and Lincoln sold 1,193 Navigators. Let me ask you how many volts and Leafs were made in that time period that could be sold. And let me ask you, if you go to a Chevy lot are you going to see any volts if you go to a cadillac lot are you going to see some escalades the answers are no and yes boys and girls (laughs) you know they're under they're they're equating this low numbers of sales with lack of demand and the demand is very high let let's do an article about how many people are on waiting lists for these cars anybody on a waiting list for an escalade or a navigator i don't think so (laughs) I, I guess the question is, if supply wasn't constrained, would they have been able to sell 3,000 of either vehicle? And that's well, a very good question. You know, Nissan has, what, 20,000 people on list for leave? 100,000 people on list for leave? I don't even know anymore. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I noticed uh, today, just doing some reading, that there's 3,000 people that have ponied up the deposit for the Model S Tesla. Wow. Awesome. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's surprising. But, you know, and again, yeah, Linda, you're totally dead on right. I mean, that, but it is still, there's still people buying a lot of these big cars. And, and sure there are. Well, yeah. Because they what? can't buy a Leaf because it's not on the lot. Right, no. right. And, and not, that the... someone, not that someone who's buying an Escalator or Navigator wants a Leaf. No, I get that. But, you know, it's the same tired retread argument. Yeah. I'm turning my mic off. You go, Tony. Well, I was just thinking that, you know, people need these Escalades and Lincoln Navigators for all the uh, the heavy-duty off-roading <laughs> that, that they do, you know, <laughs> kicking around in the mud out in the woods. But, um, you know, in the Escalades and the Navigators and the whatever, I mean, of course, dealers are trying to move them. So they're going to give all kinds of incentives and all kinds of, you know, sign now and you can have this. And, you know, they're doing everything they can to push them out the door. You know that it, it it does drive me crazy when they try to compare these things, and I agree it's not a it's not a fair comparison. I, I'm actually surprised that the sales for Escalades and Navigators are so low. 
like 1500 a month uh that's pretty low compared to what they used to be now when you compare them to like the leaf or what uh, something of that ilk then you know they're going to look considerably larger but you compare them to like the prius and that's maybe what 10 percent of prius sales so right. I, think, I think that's a good step for the for the industry Okay, I, 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 absolutely. Again, this article definitely, you know, uh, Linda's pointed out, as I pointed out, you know, that it's, they, they, they slanted it in a sense to say, oh, look, we're still selling a lot of Escalades, they're not selling many of them leaf things, uh, ignoring the Prius and, and other vehicles that are fuel efficient, that are selling in huge numbers. Uh, but I'm still staggered that like 3,000 people sign their name on the line for an Escalade. Yeah, you know, yeah, and you know, when you're, you're talking about waiting lists, I was... I was thinking, yeah, the waiting list on a on an Escalade is, hey Joe, can I borrow your pen? <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. They're on a waiting list to find a, a buyer so they can trade and get out of that thing, get out from underneath it. <laughs> yeah, you know, and you That's know, I be still a long think list too. I still think that the dealers, you know, and the manufacturers, you know, mark them down and they they do the incentives and. I think they they want to do everything they can to get these things off their lots before gas hits four dollars again. I mean, I, I honestly believe that. And people are so short sighted and so small minded that um, they're going to buy these damn things. And with any luck, in three months, in six months, they're going to be unable to drive it because gasoline's too expensive. And then they're going to say, "Why the hell did we ever buy this thing?" Well, guess what? You have a five year lease. <laughs> or uh, or a car payment. Good luck with that. How's that four dollar gas working out for you? Whoa, they're extending them past five years now. Five years is on the low end for some of these uh, domestic manufacturers, unfortunately. Oh wow! I mean, you can get for a, a seven year uh, loan from some of these places. Surely not a seven year lease, though. Who would do that? <laughs> oh God, I hope not. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I didn't mean to say lease. I mean, I meant to say loan. But uh, wow. RJ makes a good point in the chat room that. Uh, that the people who are buying an Escalade or a Navigator, they don't care about the price of gas. And I think that's probably mostly true. What's definitely true is they're not thinking about the price of gas. Mm -hmm. And they may very well be those same people that in a month are going to be bitching about how much it costs to fill up their car. Well, I, so I have to ask, you know, people who don't care about the price of gas because they're going to buy an Escalade, do they not care about the price of gas because they are wealthy or because they're buying the Escalade to try to look rich? Yep. Yes to both. I think so. I mean, because when I see someone who is financially wealthy, they're not, to, the, what I've seen, nine times out of ten, they're not driving the Escalade. They're driving the Acura or the, um, or the, the, the smaller BMW or something, you know, or the Lexus Hybrid or something. They're not, they don't buy the boat because they're smarter than that. Um, I mean, there's certainly people that can afford the gas that are buying the vehicles. And there are certainly a lot of people that, like you very astutely pointed out, Tony, that they're buying the car to, to put on a, a, a cloak, you know, to, to put on, to pretend they're something that they may or may not be. Uh, and later on, you know, when it costs $120 to fill up that gas tank, they're going to be like, what, what was I thinking? What did I do wrong? Why is America charging so much for gasoline? And they'll be the ones <laughs> screaming the loudest for the Federal Reserves to be emptied. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <clears throat> the thing about this article that did bother me, though, is its conclusion, which probably is an accurate conclusion, that if the sales of these fuel, econo fuel economic cars don't pick up, we won't meet the fuel economy standard of 35.5 MPG by 2016. And I think that's just sad. I think we should meet and exceed that well before then. And, you know, I'm sad to read that we might not. Uh, I don't know why they set the goal like that. Um, you know, hell, as far as I'm concerned, I would have no problem hearing that a law was passed that said you can no longer sell, you know, regular vehicles that average less than 15 miles per gallon. How dare you limit consumer choice? What are you, a socialist? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bite it. <laughs> I am too, so don't worry about it. <laughs> I think the market I mean, is going to is going to limit those uh, those choices. You don't have to necessarily yeah. do it. The prices get high enough. I think it's going to work itself out a little bit. Well, I would like to believe that. I honestly would like to believe that. But I read an article today in the Detroit Free Press that seems to fly in the face of that logic. 
<laughs> um, I just wish that, that companies like, well, I'll, I'll first say it. I, I wish that companies that uh, portray themselves as green and have a green halo vehicle uh, wouldn't then, you know, have their crutch be uh, their SUV lineup and truck lineup, which they make a bajillion dollars off of because they're such high profit vehicles. Uh, pointing the finger at Toyota here. You know, their their Highlander, their Tundra are two of probably their most profitable vehicles. And they have the Prius. And sure, the Highlander might be up there with uh, fuel economy with the SUV, SUV lineup, but with every generation of the Highlander, it has it continues to grow in size. And I mean, look at the size of the Sequoia now. The Sequoia is literally, you could fit a Sequoia inside of the Sequoia mm-hmm. now. <laughs> yeah, it's got like the little mini plane out the back that you can do <laughs> and things get ugly yeah uh yeah, yeah, yeah I, and, right. and toyota has been part and parcel with this national north north american automobile alliance this like execrable lobbying group that's fought against all kinds of things whether it's uh, higher cafe uh, fuel guidelines or you know safety or whatever I mean it's, it's just a reprehensible lobbying group and Toyota's right in there you know uh, same with Honda and mm-hmm. a bunch of other companies that you know uh, that may do good things and, and you know or and companies like Chrysler or GM that are making the Escalade and or whose you know lowest highest mileage car is the Avenger? And Patrick in Oregon, you know, says in the chat, he, he says, "What's wrong with profit?" And I don't, he might be, you know, making a joke, but uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with with making profit as an as an auto manufacturer. But I think at the same time, you have a responsibility to, uh, you know, if you're going to portray yourself in a way then you need to portray yourself that way across the lineup of your vehicles and be a leader. Uh, and not just do what makes you the most money. Consistency? Oh, mm-hmm. now, now you're really talking fantastic stuff. Wow. Yeah, you know, these 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 increased EPA laws, um, you know, I, you know as soon as these, these things, these bills get discussed, all the automobile manufacturers are just jumping up and down screaming, you know, how they're going to go broke lobbying against these things. <laughs> uh, was it somebody from was it was it Honda or was it Toyota that said that uh whenever you know stricter fuel economy standards are passed that some of these companies their you know GM's approach is to hire 50 lawyers whereas whereas they hire 50 engineers you know yeah i heard i i'm wanting to say that it was somebody at Honda that said that but i think it's you know the the bigger lesson there is i think yeah i mean there's you, you don't fear this stuff you know they should uh they sh- they should try to rise to the occasion and you know let their engineers be engineers you know the unrestrained pursuit of short term profits is sort of like bad for the soul of your company I think but that's but sort would, of a business philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> well, fifty engineers probably cost the same as one of the lobbyists. <laughs> it, it would just be and it would be good business just to hedge your bets. In my probably. opinion. But yeah, can't argue with that. That's the thing. I mean, the the problem is nobody wants to walk away from the table and leave money on it. And as long as people are buying, or as long as people are willing to buy big, stupid cars or big, useful cars, whatever they are, uh, these guys are going to fight over making them because they can make a ton of money on it. Yeah. I, I hate to say it, but in the end, like so many things, it comes down to the populace having some discipline and having some sense of things larger than themselves. And, you know, we've seen how successful that's been. Well, that's why we need less less government in our lives, because yeah. people are smart enough to make, you know, appropriate purchasing decisions. And, and, and I'm not a, an advocate of the quote-unquote nanny state. I'm just, you know, saying so at some point, rational people can look at a situation and go, we've got to put a control in somewhere, because the, the customers aren't doing it, and the car companies aren't doing it, but we know that it's good for us in the long term to get from point A to point B. So since the market, quote unquote, isn't going to do it, and you know, it never the, the market seldom self-regulates properly, uh, you know, where do where do we step in? I mean, that's the discussion we should be having. 
Um, I think it would be great if everybody was like, wow, if I buy this Escalade now in three years when gas might be five or six or seven dollars a gallon, how am I going to afford to drive it? You know, but people don't think like that. People don't no. think like that. No, not at all. Some people do. Most people don't. Yeah, and just like we talked about last week with gas prices, it, it, as much as people hate government, government intervention into things, I think that's what it is going to take in the automotive industry to change, uh, you know, buying, buying habits. Like if states charge sales tax based on uh, the MP, an MPG table, that would probably uh, make people think more about their MPG, uh, the MPGs of the cars that they're purchasing. Oh, I'm all for that. Yeah, um, you know, put a, a carbon tax on the purchase of, of vehicles, and you pay higher in gas tax because you're going to get lower mileage. Uh, but anything... Well, you could, Go ahead, Linda. I was going to say, you could add factor in also the weight of the vehicle because you know, the heavier vehicle does more damage to the roads and add a couple cents for that mm -hmm. so that I'm not paying the same with my 1,800-pound car as Joe and the Escalade is doing. I just well, had that discussion with somebody today. I said, regarding the insurance, I said I would, I would be... a. Uh, my my tax title license and you know my my plates and my insurance. I would be happy if they just billed me by the pound. There you go. It's yeah. just not going to happen, folks. It's not. It's not because most things that seem to make sense get struck down. Well, and even a really fuel efficient car. I'm going to bring this up just because my. Um, I mean, yeah, sure, I drive fuel efficient cars. But uh, I th I think that the biggest modification you can make to your to your car or whatever to to get better gas mileage on anything you drive is just the way you're driving it. Um, you know these these fuel efficient cars can still be gas hogs if you just rot rot them around town. So I think that's it's important to focus on education for how to drive efficiently with people. I mean that's that's my sacred cow there. I mean that's that's what I'm all about. But um, I don't know how would you know. Maybe you know driver's training. Maybe uh, maybe there should be some focus on how to drive a little more efficiently and a little more responsibly. Um, oh, people will that. sit there and they'll they'll take the class, whatever, get their thing, and then you know, work, leave room. Yeah, parking. Lot. They'll get an accident driving <laughs> away from the safety training. Yeah, yeah, you get a ticket for doing a burnout away from the uh, the hypermiling training course, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I was. Uh, I was going to mention this on the show this week. I was watching The Amazing Race on Sunday night, and uh, they were in India this week. And I don't know if you watched The Amazing Race, but it's a, it's like I think they're down to eight teams, and they have to go from you know point A to point B, uh, and whoever gets there last gets kicked off. Anyway, so they're riding in a cab in India, and they're <laughs> they're in uh, traffic, and like they actually made a point of talking about how. They were stuck in traffic, so the engine was turned off on the car. So I thought that was cool to hear that in a place like India, they think to turn off the engine when they're stuck in traffic. Hmm. Because fuel's expensive. Yeah, and that's probably what it comes down to there. Yeah, fuel's expensive. I mean, it's the same, again, it goes back to when I walk outside at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and I see a dozen or more SUVs with the engines idling, waiting. Yeah. 20, 20 minutes before their kid's going to get out of school. Do you guys think we're ever going to see anti-idling legislation? It seems to me I heard um, someone speaking about that, uh, at least in Canada and some metropolitan areas, they've got, uh, they've got maybe just, just a little bit of a, a push for some anti-idling stuff. Do you ever see that happening in the USA? Because I have, I have my doubts. There are municipalities in the United States that have enacted anti-idling ordinances and in fact my town is considering it that's good uh, in the main no i don't think it'll ever happen i think locally you'll see some some municipalities do that but mm -hmm. um i i'm sorry i have a very cynical view today yeah i'm very cynical <laughs> of that and i i also think yeah you know like good luck enforcing it kind of thing well in, Pat, yeah, I, in the chat how's i going to fly in texas <laughs> Pat in the chat room just said, and I mean, something I totally agree with. When things are cheap, they'll be abused. They'll be wasted. People don't see the need that because it, because fuel's cheap, they still don't. They don't. Why save it? Mm -hmm. Why should I bother? You know, and I can't. I just, I mean, like my head boggles at that. But 
I understand that most people think like that and okay, I have to accept it whether or not I can train them out of it or rant them out of it or shame them out of it or mm-hmm. enlighten them. Uh, you know, most people don't care about gas until it gets expensive. Well, I, you know, we're talking about gasoline and, you know, this week and last week, everyone's talking about nuclear fuel and, you know, we're going to have nuclear reactors and, you know, and whatever. And, you know, here we are as a country trying to decide how we're going to power our country when I can look down the street and see dozens of houses with seemingly every house light on, plus all the outside lights, plus they still have the Christmas lights, you know, and, you know, here we are trying to keep electricity cheap and people are wasting it to, you know, Patrick's point. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's everything. It's not just gasoline. It's everything that's consumable. We do everything we can to keep it cheap. To, to try and alleviate the cost of it, and people end up abusing it. Well, let's not beat that too much to death. And, uh, and since we're on the topic of cheap fuel, uh, Engadget reported that an MA, a MIT professor, a Dr. Daniel Nocera, uh, has announced an invention that he says is 10 times more efficient at photosynthesis than a real-life leaf. Now you're thinking, well, photosynthesis, I mean, what are we going to do with that? Um, Basically, what he's talking about is a device that he's made that uh, takes inexpensive catalysts made of nickel and cobalt, um, you place them in a gallon of water, put it in direct sunlight, and the catalysts break down the, the, uh, the water into hydrogen and oxygen gases. And as anyone who's listened to this show for more than 10 minutes probably knows, <laughs> more than 10 minutes. part of the big thing for, uh, for hydrogen is like, where are you going to get it? Now, mm. I, I saw this, and because I'm that kind of like science geek, I'm like, wow, this is totally cool, totally awesome. And then I followed one of the links on this story to a story from August of 2008 in Engadget, where an MIT scientist uh, a Dr. Daniel Nocera um, said that he's developed, and I quote, solar storage nirvana, the energy crisis is solved. And this was a device to create hydrogen and oxygen and store it in a fuel cell. Wow. Um, so- <laughs> this time he was using cobalt metal, phosphate, uh, phosphate, and platinum to do it in in neutral tap water, and using uh, uh, photovoltaic panels to uh, speed the reaction. Uh, I, so I don't, you know, like on one hand, like oh man, I totally hope this is true because wouldn't hydrogen cars really be cool? And if you could just make hydrogen at home, you know, with just putting a bucket of water in the sun. That's awesome, you know. Mm-hmm. Who wouldn't who wouldn't support that? And then I go back three years and I read this and I'm like, oh no, this guy's been banging his head against this wall for a while. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably the same guy who was banging his head against the wall 20 years ago too. Yeah, Patrick says platinum's cheap. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, it, it's yeah. I, I think we're still looking for unicorn farts here or something, you know. <laughs> so uh, I thought they were tears, man. Uh, to, you know, really, it's any 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 emission from a, any emission from, <laughs> from, from emission. a unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> if you can harness that unicorn emission, you're golden. Yeah, or platinum, as the case may be. Unicorn oh, yeah, yeah. burps are the real. That's where it's concentrated. <laughs> I, so, I, anybody have anybody want to chime in on this sort of disappointing science thing that I was all yeah. excited about before? You know, I just. Um, yeah, this somebody posted to this on Prius chat, and people got talking about it. And some people were taking issue with the uh, um, the comparison that it is ten times more efficient at photosynthesis than a real life leaf. And um, you know, some people were saying, well, the the main purpose of a of a plant's leaf is not to create hydrogen and oxygen. You know, it's to create the starches that keeps the plant alive. So. Like, you didn't really make a leaf. You made a machine that will separate water into its constituent parts. Yes. 
you know, it's just, you know, comparing it to a, a leaf and calling it photosynthesis. Photosynthesis at its core requires chloroform. And if all you're using is two metals, then you're kind of lacking that. And, you know, I just, I don't know. The, to call it an artificial leaf, I think, is just goofy. Kind of goofy marketing. Well, and the other thing in this article th- today that got me was... Uh uh, Nocera supposedly signed a deal with Tata Motors, the Indian company that makes some really cool um, small uh, vehicles, EVs, and hybrids. Uh, so I'm wondering what Tata is seeing in this that I'm not. I'm hoping it's something. Maybe the dude's really done it. And again, I think all of us would probably be really happy. You know, like, woohoo, we're making hydrogen at home. Uh, although mm-hmm. I can't wait to see the exploding house stories that come up after that. You know, like, pure oxygen and pure hydrogen stored in your home. Think about it this way, though. How many com- companies had to pass on it for Tata to get a hold of it? Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> that is sort of an interesting point, Danny. So what I'm wondering is once he, once he creates the hydrogen and the oxygen, and I'm going to assume there's twice as much hydrogen as oxygen, um, wouldn't the two of them need to be separated in some way to keep them from reconstituting into water? Uh, yeah, I mean, in the older article, it actually shows, like, separate pipes coming from his converter to hydrogen and oxygen storage, and then it pumping the appropriate hydrogen into the fuel cell to store the energy, but, uh, again, this was a device, obviously, that didn't quite work out, because now we're talking about a slightly different device, and you know what, I I mean... (laughs) Part of me really wants to hope this is true, and maybe this guy's spent years and years working on this, and it's really, you know, he's really found something now. I hope so. I really do hope so, but I'm also really tired of chain- chasing the hydrogen unicorn. Mm-hmm. So. And um, speaking of chasing unicorns, uh, there was an interesting kind of, I don't know, uh, sort of like the TMZ moment, I guess, for lack of a better way of putting it, in the news uh, today. Uh, apparently, Tesla is suing the BBC for a Top Gear show uh, that ran two years ago uh, when they did their initial review of uh, the Tesla Roadster. Uh, and for those of you that aren't Top Gear viewers, uh, briefly, uh, Jeremy Clarkson, who uh, is the main host of Top Gear, uh, the the British version uh, took the they they ran the Tesla Roadster through their normal kind of racetrack thing and you know cool sexy video shots and all that and he he was really kind of impressed and Clarkson famously despises hybrids and EVs he hates them uh, and he was kind of raving about it and then about halfway through the review uh, the car quote-unquote, runs out of charge, and we see in the videotape some people from the show pushing it into the airplane hangar they use to service the vehicles and charging it up, and then we start hearing about, oh, it takes 16 hours to charge, and oh, the brakes mysteriously broke, and then oh, the second one ran out of charge, too, and the car is really impractically priced, and, and it, it, uh, it, the whole thing concludes with this, and I'll quote what, Car- uh, what Clarkson ended the whole review with. It's just a shame that in the real world, it absolutely doesn't work mm-hmm. to the Tesla Roadster. Um, Tesla's kind of sat on this for a couple of years, and uh, apparently what spurred them into action this week uh, was that they're seeing, it, they're seeing the show streaming on Netflix, they're seeing it on DVD, and it hasn't, they haven't changed it. Uh, Tesla's contention is that the car didn't run out of juice, that they faked that, and that the brakes didn't break in the car, that it wasn't uh, a poorly produced vehicle. And uh, Tesla says they have proof, which was sort of like, wow, I mean, you know, that was kind of a big deal. Until the BBC came out today with a press release. Uh, Oops, not that one. It was this one. I have to read the right article. Um... And uh, they, they, the BBC says, and I quote, the BBC st- stands by the program and will be vigorously defending this claim. Uh, I guess the last thing I'll toss in before I shut up is uh, those of you who aren't familiar with the defamation law in uh, the UK, it is significantly different 
uh, than it is here in the United States. And it is, I don't want to say easy to prove, but it is relatively easy to prove, uh, especially compared to the United States. Um, if Tesla has evidence, um, BBC is going to be coughing up some serious cash on this one. Well, the difference, I think, in the, in the U.K. is that the, uh, in terms of libel laws, and they're pushing, actually, there's, there's kind of a grassroots movement for libel law reform over there, but it's totally different for, uh, for them than it is in, in the United States here, where the, where the burden of proof is, in fact, on the, uh, on the accuser. Over there, you know, you're, you have to prove that you, you know, you have to prove that you, you didn't do what they said you did. It's, it's totally different, and libel, uh, libel laws in England are such, it's, it's, very easy for these things to spiral out of control financially, um, and there's a such thing, in fact, as libel tourism, where, you know, if you can get somebody into to English court for, you know, like a libel case, um, you do it, you know, because because the laws are, are quite favorable favorable over there for that. Um, it's, you know, I mean, did you guys see the episode that that they're talking about? I've seen it several yeah. times. Yeah, it's no. I actually have not. Uh, if yeah, you follow the first link, there is a 10 minute and 25 second segment of the show. You can watch the entire bit. Mm -hmm. All right. Hold on just a minute. I'll be about 11 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty good. And they didn't, they didn't barbecue it as much, certainly, as uh, Clarkson has in the past for, say, oh, I don't know, the Prius, because he's, he's really been outspoken critic. Um, just, just can't say enough bad things about the Prius, or the Prius, as, as they say. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I thought it was a little weird with them make, going out of their way to show the, uh, you know, pushing the car and talking about the second one and that whole, it just doesn't work in the real world. Well, these, I mean, these are automotive journalists. They don't live in the flipping real world anyway. You know, they're living in the, the world of, uh, you know, horsepower and, you know, and, and all that. So it's, it's kind of a kind of a slant. I'm not surprised that Top Gear did what they did, but man, I thought this uh, thought this was kind of cold, you know, after two years, you know, and I guess it's just now coming to a head where, you know, what do you think has changed such that Tesla is moving on this now? Because this is not new. No, but it said in the article that Tesla contacted them and, um, you know, the, the, the Tesla was talking to the BBC and I'm, I'm trying to skim and find it. But then what it is just now is that um, this episode is coming out on DVD and coming to the United States. Um, hmm. And, you know, they kept it. Even though Tesla was protesting it, uh, the BBC kept it and, and is, is perpetuating it in um, syndication and in the DVD box or, you know, whatever. Um, but, you know, yeah, I, um, I would actually like to see you know, whether, you know, with a judge there or the jury there or, you know, however this plays out, I would like to see Tesla give Top Gear the, um, a, a car fully charged and say, here, you drive this car as hard as you want and you drain that battery in 55 miles. I'd like to see them do it. And if they can't do it, then they're going to have to admit that they faked it. I mean, you see what I'm saying here? Oh, I, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like a hard case to prove. It, it really doesn't. They're going to be, you know, you said they're going to be dishing out some, some cash. I think they're going to be coughing up some, um, oh, hell, I just, some reputation. Well. You know, I mean, I, I know, you know, Top Gear, you're talking about Top Gear and reputation and, you know, Jeremy Clarkson, but people do watch some of these shows expecting, you know, in some, in some regards, real journalism oh. whether that's true or not you know i i i hate it when shows or newspapers or magazines hide behind the oh well it's really just entertainment you know because the truth is it isn't and they know it and their readers know it and if there's no factual content then nobody would bother with these things it'd be fiction Nobody's mm -hmm. going to read a novel about the Tesla or about the Bugatti Veyron. People want to know what it really does. And yeah. that's part of the appeal, aside from the really great video that they shoot, and that it's a funny show, and that the hosts go back and forth. Uh, they, they assume that there is some factual content in here. So to, to hide behind the entertainment flag is disingenuous at best. Well, to hide behind the entertainment flag and then say, it's a shame that in the real world it absolutely doesn't work. Yeah. That's no, that's not 
entertainment. Yeah, that's that's, that's being a bit extreme. He should have qualified that statement a little bit, but uh, I mean, that's that's um you know that's John Stewart saying, oh my show is just entertainment, but it's a shame that in the real world Governor Walker is just a douchebag. <laughs> but see, that's <laughs> truthful say. reporting. Well, now that would be yeah. See, I I need a better um a better example, but you know no, that crosses the line from entertainment to slander. Well, and they say that this stuff was built into a script that was written before the car was ever tested. Yeah. Well, so they you know, knew right. how they wanted it to come out. Yeah. 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 Shock, shock, right, with with these uh, shows, right? I mean, they've got a narrative that they're going to tell, and uh, clearly I think that the conclusion that uh, Clarkson came to, I'm using scare quotes here, after testing the Tesla, I'm sure would have been consistent with, you know, what you might have expected him to say anyway. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not surprised that this is... Um, Happened. I do remember now that you guys bring it up. Do you remember um, seeing something in here about those scripts? See, now that could be the kind of thing that that could possibly come back and bite the BBC a little bit, you know? Yeah, because what that really means is that Clarkson is not really actually reviewing these cars. He's just reading what somebody puts on a script and says, "Here, read this." And they're going to say, "Yes, he's an entertainer," and it's just like, I mean, to me, yeah, this, you know, these are automotive journalists, and th this this represents no journalistic integrity. He just, um, you know, he, I, for ideological reasons, he is opposed to um, these alternative transportation type of cars. But I mean, he he did talk about how how fun and how cool the car was. So I don't I don't know if that's their attempt at some sort of a false balance because the, what impresses these guys is you know is the vroom vroom factor does it go fast and you know clearly the tesla is a is a friggin fast car so i mean he just yeah but him for him to put that you know just kind of poison the whole thing in the end say it just doesn't work in the real world that's that's a little too absolute of a statement for my for my taste but i don't i don't really think that uh, clarkson or anybody on that show is necessarily obsessed with journalistic integrity or being uh, objective so well, and that is a bit of a harsh thing for him to say about real world, because really, who's driving the car at, at full throttle at 125 miles an hour for very far in the real world? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. full, full throttle on a racetrack. That's real world? Sure. Mm, not for most of us. We all have yeah. private racetracks to drive our Teslas on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I haven't right. got mine yet. Oh, I'm sorry, Linda. I know. Always the last. I'm too busy so protesting. I have been too busy protesting. <laughs> Just stay home for a day or two. You One or two. I promise. Next we'll week. We'll have it delivered. See, they keep trying to deliver. You're not there to sign for it. Uh. They that's won't it. just leave it in the driveway. I mean, that's just crazy talk. <laughs> because it is a driveway. <laughs> it is a driveway. Well, speaking of epic fails, uh, there was a report uh, last week, uh, right, in fact, the day we did the show, that did, came out, unfortunately, too late for us to add it to last week's show, uh, that uh, the Volvo C30 EV that uh, they're testing right now, way up north somewhere in Sweden, or just as north of the Ar Arctic Circle, which could very well be in Sweden, um, uh, apparently the cold up there really did the car in, according to this report, and that it cut the range in half. Now, this goes even in the face of the fact that the C30 Volvo has an ethanol-powered heater uh, to keep the batteries and the interior of the car uh, somewhat warmer than the exterior. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, wow. So, I don't know. You know, in the face of, again, uh, other people reporting that the, the mini EVs actually did have range and there weren't range problems in the cold uh, and things that we've heard about the Volt being tested in, in cold areas. Um, this is for me one of those things I just I, like I can't get a handle on it. Well I think we have to define cold. I mean <clears throat> you know I, I tell people that my temperature drops when it's cold here in Chicago and I'm talking about you know going out to the car and a couple of times I've gotten in the car and it was minus six. You know here they're testing this thing in minus 22. <laughs> I mean, big that, big that difference goes, there. I mean, you know, it says it's it's minus thirty C, and it's minus twenty two F with a capital F, and I think I know what that F stands for. <laughs> oh, I know. Yep. Frickin' cold. Yes, <laughs> frickin' freezing in here. <laughs> it's minus thirty cold. That's minus twenty two. Fuck. <laughs> 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 So, you know, if, if you're driving your car in a constant minus 22 because you live north of the Arctic, 
it's just time to move, not buy a new car. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, well, here's I think the, there's a lot of charging stations available up there. <laughs> yeah, well, there's that. <laughs> right. Even the electrons are moving slower at minus 22. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, here's sort of the point that I wanted to, to make by bringing this up is that uh, one of the unknowns that we don't have or that we that, that it's still unknown with, with EVs is in colder places. And, you know, there's a lot of them in the United States. Uh, and in, obviously in Canada and lots of other places where lots of people live, um, you know, these are issues that need to be addressed yet. That, that, uh, and it's one thing that I know Danny and I talked about some time ago, probably everybody, you know, it's nice when they roll the volt out or when they roll the leaf out in California and Florida and Arizona and, you know, all these kind of balmy states. Um, but when somebody in International Falls, Minnesota's had one for a couple of years, and I'm going to really kind of like go, oh, okay, I get that. I get that now. You know, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to see if the car is really engineered to perform in a variety of conditions. Oh, and it's obvious why they are releasing these cars in the balmy areas. I mean, I mean, we knew that from the from the onset. And you know, I applaud Volvo for you know driving this car in extreme cold temperatures to see what it does, and then telling people the the results. RJ asks a good question in the chat room. He says, don't gas cars break down when it's that cold, too? And, you know, yeah, they do. And it, it can be zero. And I know people whose cars aren't starting because they're little under the hood batteries are failing, you know, to ignite the the alternator, the starter, whatever. Um, you know, diesel turns to gel. And it it's not just, I mean, at least these cars started, right? There's something. Yeah, they just went uh, half the 100-mile rating. They got under 50 miles of range. I'm a I'm afraid this this whole cold weather impact on battery performance in electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles. I don't think this is going to go away until we get away from this chemical storage of, you know, of, of energy in the batteries. Until we see like a, a huge, huge upgrade in our battery technology. I think this is something that you know engineers are going to fight and they're going to make progress on it for sure. But I mean, yeah, this and yeah, and until you know electric vehicles are you know, not not so new, and and you start seeing them out on the roads. This is just going to be news. I mean, this is this is what the uh, the journalists want to talk about because you know people are afraid of this. I guess. Um, well, this is the big know, thing that's going to hold people back from buying an EV. I think in the next yeah. several years. I mean, whenever I talk to anybody about a electric car, it's it's always like uh, you know this the leaf gets a hundred mile range and you know, the person I'm telling about it says, yeah, but how much does it get in, in real life? Like 30? And it's like, okay, well, <laughs> you know, consumers have gotten accustomed to, uh, you know, taking MPG numbers for what they are and they don't really care if they meet them or not. But for some reason, EVs <laughs> are held up to a higher standard. And as long as we have such fluctuations in range, um, I think it's going to continue to be a sticking point for consumers. What was it earlier this week? Some something on our Facebook page that somebody something was brought up about EV cars, and I had to chime in with something that it's it's not original to me, but it, you know I kind of get the impression that some of the resistance uh, uh, to change that that we see with with the average Joe when it comes to hybrid cars previously and then now EVs is is going to be an awful lot like what you saw back when um, the first horseless carriages started making on the roads people yes. were just saying oh yeah you're you know you're you're um you're going to get stranded you're going to run out of gas you know you know now a horse on the other hand that you'll be able to get you home it's this is the same thing i mean progress and change will be fought at every step of the way it's unfortunate but it, it's true on almost anything yeah it's it's fought every step of the way until it is accepted as the inevitable or the obvious conclusion mm-hmm and then, yeah, then it's it's after it's accepted and it's mainstream and, you know, then the, perhaps the same people, if, if we're fortunate enough to live long enough to see this, the next time the big major change comes in a technology or whatever, you may see some of those same people who are so vehemently opposed to the, you know, to the electric cars, uh, you know, clinging to the electric cars and, and poo-pooing the next, <laughs> the next step or whatever. I, I think it's just... It's just a. It's indicative of uh, you know change in progress. People people just resist. So, yeah, I agree. Well, I saw this. I saw this car in Chicago at the auto show, and it's a nice little car. 
I mean, it feels nice. You get in and it's got solid doors and fit and finish is awesome. Um, you know, I hope, I hope that this doesn't present a real big problem for them because, because it'll be a good car to have out there. Yeah. Volvo makes a good car mm-hmm. in general. Well, they used to, where do they make them now? Oh, yeah. I had to bring that up. I love yeah. Volvos. <laughs> I own Volvos most of my life. Well, well, you know, Ford had them for a while and then Ford sold them to some Chinese company, right? I think so. I so, believe. Are they, I, I don't even be, know if they're still made in Europe or not. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that's true. I don't know. Did you see the update there that said, um, Victor wrote us to let us know that the creatures in the video are indeed reindeer? Yeah. <laughs> not elk. The person responsible for such an egregious factual error has been sacked and a sizable donation <laughs> made to the Save the Reindeer from Swedish EVs <laughs> Foundation. Classic <laughs> Python reference. That's gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Well, all they have to do is outrun it. <laughs> they can run 51 miles. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Ouch. Nice. And speaking of, uh, I don't even, I don't have a segue now. Thanks. <laughs> uh, speaking of things we didn't know would ever happen, <laughs> this week... Our favorite car company, Fisker. Wait, cue cue the Cubs win the pennant. (laughs) (laughs) It's a bunch of dead silence, isn't it? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Fisker Automotive put through the first car through their production line. And there's even a picture of like a whole bunch of guys in blue jumpsuits standing there with a Karma in what looks like sort of a kind of a production line thing. And, uh, yeah. So they did it. They built one. Yay! All right. Hold awesome. on, guys. I got I to gotta get the phone. Um, I think it's Satan calling. He says they're testing Volvo EVs. <laughs> <laughs> because hell froze over. <laughs> nice. nice. <laughs> uh, anybody want to say something good about Fisker? Um, I'm still trying to figure out how to pronounce the um, automotive plant in Finland. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it starts with two U's. <laughs> any any word that starts with two U's and ends in punky. Punky. Usika. Usika. Punky. Cow punky. It might be Hawaiian for all I know. It kind of looks like that. Okay, so here's the one joke that, that everybody on the panel has seen that <laughs> you listeners haven't seen. They also announced that uh, 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 Fisker Automotive spokesman Roger Ormisher told the Automotive News Europe, uh, he said, and I quote, We're going to be ramping up very slowly, <laughs> carefully, to ensure quality. This year, we want to get over 7,000 deliveries. And, of course, my headline for that was uh, one down, 6,999 to go. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of snarky and pointless. I mean, it's March. Could they build seven, almost 7,000 more cars this year? Who knows? But, hey, hopefully they, hopefully they do, and hopefully people line up to buy the $90,000 plug-in hybrid. Um, and, you know. Yeah, crap, 7,000. Well, we're at the end of the month. That's convenient. So... We have nine months, so we have 7,000 divided by nine months, 777 a month. Be pretty. Divided by 31, 25 cars a day. So they're rolling these out in less than one an hour. (laughs) Which, you know, if they have multiple, you have multiple lines running, you know, when things start clicking, then maybe, but Wow. See, I was thinking, how many of the are they really going to sell seven thousand of these this year? It says deliveries. He doesn't say anything about sales. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take mine for free. He picked his words. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I just don't see seven thousand happening this year. I mean, that just seems that's that's ridiculous. Might as well be seven million. I mean, I don't think they're going to do it this year. It'd be awesome if they did, but mm-hmm. I'd take one. I'd, I'd take I, two. I would take like yeah. ten, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As long as I get the ice cube and the girl. Well, they're only... Oh, oh, oh. Uh, they're only... 
I'm sorry. What was I? Yeah. <laughs> hey, Tony, it's about an ice cube, cube right, Tony? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're only eighty-eight thousand, and then with the um, the the federal, don't they don't they qualify for something? Oh yeah. Okay. Seventy-five hundred It's not the full, no, because it's a plug-in. No, it's a hybrid. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and you only get five grand back on that. Oh well, then. That that means you can buy floor mats. <laughs> right. Well, I like how they're all standing around because none of them had anything else to do. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> exactly. And number Job two, they, they made the one car. You know, I guess <laughs> can't we not come off back and, <laughs> and make Fisker number two. They've got to go Everybody back home and right after that picture was snapped. <laughs> well, you notice it's even got a, a personalized plate that says Karma One. Mm-hmm. Yeah, then they're all you know they're all saying, "Okay, nobody tell anyone that this is just a shell. <laughs> <laughs> Don't touch it." Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh... It is awfully shiny. I'd love to see that thing in just black. I believe this is a new news source for us, Russell. Ah, uh, Africa Times. I was yeah. waiting. Africa Times, IB Times, I, International Business Times. Yeah, thank you. I was hoping someone would notice that because actually I had my choice of sources and I said, I got to go with the Africa IBT. I actually posted this up on uh, the What Drives Us Facebook page earlier this week. Oh, did you? Yeah, I think I, I said something to the. Let, let's see what. <laughs> I posted something snarky as well. From the same source? No, no, no. Different. Oh, okay. I was like, why? I never found that. Let's see, what did I say? Nice. RJ in the chat room says, where's the BBC footage of the guys pushing it? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody should dig up that dig up that video for him and post it. It's, it's a neat little piece, but... <laughs> we call him the Stig. Oh, yeah, I posted it as one down, 150,000 more to go. <laughs> Yeah, their long-term goal. Yeah. Ugh. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, speaking of goals not met, last week we talked a lot about uh, Honda and uh, the tsunami. There was a couple of stories that sort of kind of fit together, and we discussed, you know, why this may or may not be the issue. And there was a story on Market Watch, which is a dubious source at best, but they brought up a really obvious point that I don't think anybody brought up last week and forgive me my apologies to them in advance if they did but uh, apparently the issue with uh, the production is that a couple of the parts suppliers uh, for this ve- uh, for some of their vehicles uh, were wiped out and they can't get those parts and they can't build cars without those parts so in some cases I guess it's literally like a very small number of parts that can't be obtained so they can't build the cars which seems really obvious now but I didn't think of it last week did somebody else think of it last week I did, but I wasn't here. Well, I, did we, I said something about. I thought we, yeah, we we touched on. Did we? Yeah, I thought so. Well, see, I thought I saw this something along these lines in the lineup last week, but I'm not sure that we talked about it. Well, I don't know that we ever went as direct as to say that it was like a supplier being wiped out that was causing an issue. Yeah. Well, see, I had the thought, you know, this item or whatever it was last week, and I thought, well, if we get around to talking to this, I may have to mention that it, uh, you know, just just in buying simple maintenance type parts for my Honda cars, I noticed that a lot of the stuff comes from Japan, even the simple stuff. And I thought, you know, it's not going to take much to kind of derail the whole production thing because, I mean, uh, car manufacturers, if nothing else, you know, they're they're delivery of their stuff. I mean, it's all just in time and very efficient, and you know. Everything has to be in place, or it screws the whole thing. So I mean, I it wouldn't take much, you know, just because they're built uh, domestically, at least domestic for us here. You know, that doesn't mean that the powertrains come from over here, and um, just tiny little parts will screw the whole thing. <laughs> so everybody, uh, you guys who are recording the podcast, you're not watching the video, but you would enjoy the picture I put up. <laughs> <laughs> right now, right, right now, I'm showing a blown out picture of a uh, Honda um, lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All the parts that nice. go into a Honda lawnmower. <laughs> be nice. <laughs> I, I mean, it does certainly make a good point about the whole global economy and Tom Friedman, Tom idiot Friedman's flat world theory and global supply chain just isn't quite as maybe strong and impervious as 
a lot of economists would like to think, um, you know, one link breaks and you're done. You're shut. Well, I was, yeah, as I was reading this, I was also thinking that, you know, a lot of the manufacturing companies pride themselves on just-in-time inventory. And, you know, for that to work, you absolutely cannot tolerate hiccups in the supply line. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, you know, Russell, I actually thought of you, I guess it was either tonight or sometime recently, I saw a news piece that's, that Apple only has two months of inventory. And uh. they, are, they have no production running right now because... Uh, <gasps> they have no parts coming out of Japan, I guess, that go to China for production. Now, was this on something specific? Because I saw a thing that they were supposedly running low on iPod batteries. Um, I, but I don't know. They, you know, they had like B-roll of somebody playing with an iPad, but they didn't say any specific models. I haven't heard. I mean, you know, it, without going down a rat hole too much. I mean, one of the things about being cash rich is they've locked up quite literally, like the world supply of flash memory and touch screens which things like this have really screwed companies like Motorola that don't have these that haven't pre-bought this stuff um, from the suppliers uh, because now not only is Apple going to be able to get the parts uh, when the factories come back online and have all of their parts when they were online but they get them at a guaranteed price whereas you know the price of these parts is going to go up if they've got to rebuild factories and, and you know repair them. Uh, so their Apple's competitors are going to be paying much higher prices for some of these same parts. It's, uh, it was an interesting article. So where are the factories getting the parts to rebuild the factories? Is this just a, <laughs> a, a downward spiral of parts leading to parts building parts? Tony, thanks for being on the show this week. It was great. <laughs> Dude, I was an art major, okay? I mean, you know. well, my brain spins in circles now. <laughs> I will say, as I was looking at this this article, I I actually did really appreciate um, in this article where it said, "Here is a list of Honda's North American plants and the vehicles they build." Yeah, which I mean, it doesn't sound like you know that big of a deal, but. This actually flies in the face, you know, in my opinion, flies in the face of those people who say, you know, you're, you're buying a Japanese car and, you know, why don't you buy something that's made by Americans? Well, great. I'll go to uh, Greensburg, Indiana, go Hoosiers, and buy a Honda Civic, you know? You had to bring so, the Hoosiers into it, didn't you? I had to bring the Hoosiers <laughs> into it. So, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of liked that they actually posted, you know, where the plants were in, in the United States. Yeah. I, I thought it was in Ontario, and 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 Ontario and Mexico. Well, there you go. Anything else on uh, the Honda supply chain? I had no idea that any of the Acuras were built here. And uh, oh, really? Hmm. I have to admit, before that article, I didn't even think about it. I figured they were all made in Japan. All the Lexuses are still made in Japan. Are they? Lexi. Lexi. I believe all the uh, Infinities are still made in Japan. Mm. I didn't think they made the cross tour. Well, good for Honda for building them here. I just think the cross tour is one butt-ass ugly car. Point in their favor. And speaking of butt-ass ugly... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being on the nice. Tony. It's been great. Ha oh, no. Uh... Oh, that was kind of cold. Sorry about that. Yeah, sorry I couldn't make it this week. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Plug-in Cars had uh, an article on uh, EV charging stations, which as, uh, you know, we're seeing plug-ins and we're seeing the LEAF being deployed and, you know, potentially other EVs, uh, the Prius PHV later this year and, uh, and other things. Uh, these charging stations will uh, start being used, which is really cool. Um, California... Uh, strangely enough, uh, rather uncharacteristically, uh, has decided that the companies deploying these charging stations are not going to be regulated as utilities, even though they are obviously utilities, in a sense they're providing electricity. Um, apparently what this has allowed them to do is deploy these charging stations much more quickly without uh, some of the onerous regulation that uh, California 
outputs on things. Um, the interesting part of this is uh, the, the, the question then remains, okay, so if these things aren't really regulated, then that potentially means that they could be places for like real rate abuse at some point. Yeah, I mean, that's the good thing about regulation mm -hmm. is <laughs> that's an effect. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that that there is a limit, uh, I, you know, and I, I guess dovetailed in with that is what government, whether it's state or federal money, is being used to help pay for these stations and deploy them, and then if the companies operating them are basically have a free reign to just charge whatever they want, um, is this the best place for a free market experiment? Uh, is it e will it even be an issue? Will the companies be more interested in encouraging EVs and, and keeping the rates as competitive as possible? Uh, I don't know. Um, but, uh, I, I mean, on one hand, it's good that they're able to bypass things that would have slowed down getting them out there. On the other hand, in the long term, did we give away the farm once again? Yeah, Charging yeah, stations could be the railroads of the 21st century. You know, get the car companies out there to buy these up and then force you to use gas. I'll put the tinfoil hat back on the shelf. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just living no, in a state now that's selling its power plants to private energy who can charge us anything they want to for the energy coming out of it. So I'm seeing it happen firsthand. <laughs> it's, it's funny how you said they can when what you really meant was they will. <laughs> they are. <laughs> Well, yeah. Overall, though, I think it is pick, good. Pick a verb. <laughs> it is good for a, a, a young uh, industry like this to not be, dare I say, burdened by uh, by regulation. Because then only it, certain powers can get into it who can afford to comply with regulations like that. So, are you are you sort of insinuating that it's um, that? The regulations will come later. That they they strip away the regulations to let it explode and catch on, and then when they start seeing, you know, the gouging, then they'll come in and regulate it. Well, it does say in the article but you the, just legis want the legislative director for Plug in America, Jay Friedland, uh, says that the utility commission has reserved the right to regulate in the future. Yeah, which right. would be a really sensible way of doing it. Yeah, I just you know. It works. I mean, okay. When I'm when I'm in my car, I I know approximately how many miles I'm going to get out of the tank, and so when I'm you know, and there's you know, I pass a dozen gas stations in my drive, so I know that I can shop <laughs> around for the best price. But you know, when I'm thinking electric cars and charging stations, I'm thinking you have you're mixing like one part range anxiety with two part price gouging. And that just doesn't sound like a good mixture. You know what I mean? You're like preying on people's fear that they might not make it to the next one. So they better pay whatever you charge them. Um, I, that's certainly, I mean, uh, anyone who's bought gas uh, along uh, the 15 freeway in the middle of the desert between Los Angeles and Vegas certainly has seen that practice in real life. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, that we don't. I, I just don't know. I mean, it's it's. Well, time will tell. And I think Linda, you know, although she made a, a tinfoil hat joke, I mean, uh, brings up a very legitimate point. Uh, you know, a, a potential weakness in in the system. Um, it, it's certainly a matter of history that the car companies did a lot to uh, close down municipal streetcars in hundreds of U.S. cities to encourage uh, the purchase of automobiles. And there's no reason to think that a company that had an interest in selling a lot of gas-powered cars might not do something similar to slow down EVs. Um, I don't know. I'm not saying it will happen, but I think it's not tinfoil hat time at all. It's entirely reasonable to put that forward as, as a potential you know, uh, scenario. But who would you want controlling it in the beginning? Would you rather utility companies or young <laughs> startups that are in the I, vein of, you know, like a web startup willing to give it away for free to just get some market share? Right. 
I think the way California has done it is seems pretty reasonable. You know, reserving the right to regulate it, saying, okay, let's see what happens, let's put this out here, and, you know, let, let's see where it goes. Um, it, it seems reasonable because there are companies that do want to do this and that are, you know, willing to go out, you know, step out there and, and, and you know, deploy this infrastructure. So it seems right now like that's a good idea. Well, I hope it works out. I mean, I really do. Well, there you go. And Patrick, I, I think, in the in the chat room said, you know, best place to charge is at home. Absolutely. You know, charge it at home off hours. Charge it at home from a solar array. Charge it, you know, if you're Patrick, at work from your solar parking structure thing. Um, you know, that that's, uh, uh, there's there's obviously ways to do it. Uh, yeah, but, you know, I that doesn't always work for me because I'm really worried about my Tesla, you know, running out at 55 miles. I saw it on a show. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, witness now. T- Tony Schaefer of America. <laughs> Tony's going to have to testify for Tesla in the trial. Uh, Tesla Fi, baby. <laughs> Tesla Fi. Well, that's it for our news this week. Does anybody else have anything they wanted to bring up? We kind of wrapped up pretty quickly, so. Be a nice show. Yeah, I this um, week. Yeah. Yeah, I got nothing. Happy uh, April Fools to everyone. Oh, I've got oh, a yes. little thing. April Fools. Yeah. <laughs> Do you now? <laughs> I got Do a little well, you know. <laughs> With my apologies to Nicole. Oh. <laughs> that was the word around the campfire, but I didn't want to say anything. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Your Nicole said something similar to me, so. Oh, but also, oh, ooh! I didn't realize you had her number. <laughs> so she got that new iPhone again, you were talking about. Like it was, it was all in comparison, so I could understand. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Holy cow! Uh, Put those things away now, boys. Yeah, uh, no sword fighting during the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, next week I will have the opportunity to drive the. Uh, Rav Four EV powered by oh, Tesla. Shut up. <laughs> oh, it'll leave I, it, are we done? Uh, and I, I look forward to reporting back to the show. I, Suck. I, I'm really sad to announce this is Danny's last show. I'm gonna. Miss <laughs> it yeah. And uh, the son of a bitch that's driving. The, I mean, the nice guy that <laughs> drives the Rav Four EV next week. Hey, Danny, if you take me with you, I'll start a new show with you. <laughs> It'll be called uh, "Let's Test Drive." What used to drive different... us? <laughs> this old EV. <laughs> this old EV. Uh, 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 uh. You know, Linda. I think I technically own the What Drives US web domain. So. Oh, see, there you go. I think it's more than technical, actually. I think it's <laughs> <laughs> practical, actual. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, not sure if I'll be able to be on the show next week just because of scheduling, but. Uh, either next week or the week after, we'll definitely be talking about that. There we go. Well, well, hopefully they'll have a Skype from where you are, and you can give us a, a hot off the presses review. I hope so. Similar to the uh, PHV interview that we did last year. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, do please. Some of us did last year. Yeah. <laughs> do please, if you have a chance, do something really crazy with it. Okay. I mean, like go off the road. Okay. Yeah. All right. See if you can get it to run out of uh, charge in, in 55 miles and get the brakes to malfunction. And then I'm going to get a video of myself pushing it into the garage. Yeah, because, you know, it is powered by Tesla, so, you know, just keeping with the Top Gear thing. Yeah, I'm sure they would, they would love the reference and fully appreciate the, uh, the joke. Speaking of which, if you can just rip those powered by Tesla badges off that car and bring them back with you. Hey, I had already, a little bit on my insight. I was already I, thinking about you guys. Yeah, I got something for you if you can uh, just get me one of those badges. Or maybe that Tesla engine cover. You know, I could just the whole damn thing. Yeah. <laughs> could just... How about the whole damn car? Just bring it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Tell them you're driving home. If hey, you... and, and if you can, check the range um, north of the Arctic Circle. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best. I'll be in San Diego, so, you know, that's close, right? Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. Just have to drive. Closer than North Carolina. Oh God! That's right. You're going to be in my my old homeland. Well, 
have fun with that, and we look forward to that report either next week or the uh, following week, and that is not an April Fool's joke. We hope. God, I hope I don't show up and they're like, ha ha. Yeah. Psych. <laughs> Just kidding. It was last week, dude. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, didn't you wonder about the date? So, anybody else have anything? No? Mm-mm. Wow. Well, then... As See you next week on what prize us. <laughs> I had to yawn and I turned my mic off. Okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, so that's our news for this week. Uh, as always, I want to thank Michael Mannering for our amazing theme music. Please visit him at manthing.com. You can read my rantings published here regularly at PriusOwnersGroup.com. I want to send my weekly Hey Justin shout out. Hey Justin. And as always, uh, my thanks to uh, my co host, Danny, and everyone on this week's panel. And uh, everyone in the chat room, um, thanks very much for uh, making it another great show. Mr. Cooper, I turn the mic over to you, sir. Okay. Well, um, if anybody wants to follow my uh, RAV4 driving experience next week, you can do that over at PriusChat.com. I'll try to post as much as I can, and I'll also probably be posting more to Twitter than anything else, so go to twitter.com slash Prius chat and you'll find me and I'll post some pictures and we'll see how many of the badges I can steal for, for folks. Yeah. Yeah. And also just a reminder to, uh, if you're in the, uh, in the market for any Prius related accessories, go check out Prius chat.com slash shop. And when you, uh, if you do decide to place an order and you heard about us through the, uh, what drives us podcast, Put a little note in the comment section, and I will include a little freebie prize for you. Ooh. How about that? A free prize? Is this like the Danny Danny Sings the Hits on What Drives Us (laughs) CD? (laughs) It's all my latest cuts. Like a prize? Like a what prize? Like a cool prize? I'm sorry, I'm staggered by it. It's a prize they don't have to pay for, so. A gift. Yeah. <laughs> it's a gift. Okay. Sounds good. Um, Mr. Schaefer. Hey, I'm over here at the uh, What Drives Us Facebook page at facebook.com slash what drives us. And um, I first want to give a shout out to Faith, who is skipping the show this week. <laughs> Faith, don't worry, you didn't miss much. Um. <laughs> Also, a shout out to Justin, and I just posted a link an article written by our friend and Leaf owner Patrick Connor, who uh, wrote an article about the first major shipment of Nissan Leafs arriving in the U.S. Um, at PluginCars.com. So, head over to the Facebook page and uh, read this article. Um, I haven't had time to look at it yet, but it starts with a really big boat, and anything that starts with a really big boat has got to be good. <laughs> The love boat. Okay, no wait, no singing. Um, Miss Linda. Yes, sir. Take it away. We have a little something coming up called Green Drive Expo here in Madison, Wisconsin, July 23rd and 24th this summer. Um, GreenDriveExpo.com for all the information and details. I'd like to thank everyone here in the chat room and my shout out to Justin as well. Wow, that was compact and Green Drive-erific. Uh, <laughs> I like that. I'm going to use that. Mr. Holder. I'll start out by, by giving Justin a shout out as well. And uh, I'll just say, as always, that uh, anybody who wants to follow me on Twitter and see how my mileage is going day to day, I am at Hypermiler Jason and still getting my butt kicked out there. But the, the nice weather is on the way, I am told by the weatherman. So looking forward to that. No doubt. Dude, that's two of us at least. Yeah, we had how, – how's it been up there, Russell? I mean, we had like a 75-degree day last week, and then we had some snow, in fact, a few days ago. It's like, what in the <laughs> – No, it's – Can't figure it out. It's been in like the 30s and ucky here. It's just terrible. And mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I get for living in the north. Uh, but we're going to leave that just 
to where it is for right now. Um, and I'm going to tell you that you can visit us online at what drives at us to listen or download to our shows. Um, search for what drives us on iTunes. If you subscribe there, you get updated automatically. So uh, that's always a convenient way to get the show. Of course, you can stream it uh, at whatdrives.us, uh, either in MP3 form, or you can stream the very uh, visual enhanced AAC one. Um, and you, you like the show a lot? You can listen to it while we record it. If you come uh, to whatdrives.us slash live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, you can uh, interact with us. You can send us nasty messages. Did I say MP? No, I didn't. You got You said MP3 porn. <laughs> you totally you said, totally MP3, said porn. MP3 porn. It was really close. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go back and listen to that. Or M- no, M4A f- porn. Oh, no. MP3 porn? Or MP3. I don't know. You said porn at some point. <laughs> yeah. Porn, 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 porn. <laughs> I said the word porn. Uh, my apologies for that. So anyway, if you want to uh, be able to send us uh, messages while we record and ask us questions and all that in our cool, very cool chat room, uh, once again, visit us at whatdrives.us. Click live. That's Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, and we would love to have you there. And uh, so for this week, um, thank each and every one of you for uh, listening. Download us next week to find out what drives us. there for those of you that need the music i'll dub it in later you forgot about plugging our youtube channel oh did i hey listen to youtube because it's fucking cool